We pick up our study today, starting in Acts chapter number 5, verse number 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. You should notice in verse number 12 the many signs and wonders. Unlike the modern-day mega-gatherings of folks filled with fascination for so-called signs and wonders, this assembly in Acts chapter 5 was the real deal. After Peter judged Ananias and Sapphira, suddenly the fakes, the frauds, and the phonies had no desire to be part of their kingdom. Verse number 14 said, And of the rest durst no man join himself to them. That word durst is the simple past tense of the word dare. Now imagine that real signs and wonders taking place in Jerusalem, but many people did not dare to join with them. And why not? Because they knew the apostles would not put up with dishonesty or mere curiosity seekers. And by the way, if apostolic succession were a real thing today, don't you suppose that would cut down considerably on the size of some churches? The apostles, by the way, were absolutely endued with the powers of the Great Kingdom Commission. Even a brief look at Mark chapter 16 will reveal that nobody who claims to be fulfilling the Great Commission today has the power or the doctrine to fulfill it. Mark chapter 16, beginning at verse number 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now, I do not wish to cause offense to any who are preaching the gospel of the grace of God and who know to rightly divide the word of truth, which is the gospel of our salvation. If someone is preaching the gospel of the death of Christ for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day, then wonderful if one is engaged in getting that gospel to the world, then I'm for them because I'm doing the same thing. But I do want to point out that the Great Commission gospel is the gospel of the kingdom, according to Matthew chapter 24, verse number 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Let's look at what all is involved in that gospel. First of all, there is baptism for salvation. And then, 
Also, that gospel has signs following them that believe, as casting out devils, speaking with tongues, taking up serpents, and laying hands on the sick to recover them. Now, folks absolutely need to know the difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel which was given by revelation to the Apostle Paul. If no effort is made to distinguish them, only confusion can result. The first time since creation when God gave lights in the firmament for signs was when God chose Moses to be the head, the leader, and the judge of the soon-to-be-formed nation of Israel. Remember, at the point of the beginning of the book of Exodus, the children of Israel had been under the dominion of Egypt for 400 years. The Lord intended to bring them out, give them laws by which to live, and bring them into the promised land of Canaan. The signs that God gave to Moses in Exodus chapter number 4 were a confirmation that God was bringing about a change of administration for His people. So, what's the connection with the signs given to Moses and the signs that God gave in Acts chapter number 5? Well, undoubtedly, these were signs to the nation of Israel that God was again pointing out his chosen leaders for a new administration. We should not fail to notice that at the end of verse number 16 in our text, that the healings were 100%, and that included those in verse number 15, who only had the shadow of Peter to pass over them. Think about that. So very unlike the fraudulent so-called faith healers of today, these apostles were healing everyone who needed it. Now, verse 17 and verse 18. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. Now, why do you suppose that the priests were so angry? Well, number one, signs and wonders were being worked. And number two, the people were united. Number three, the people magnified the apostles. And number four, multitudes were being added to the Lord. And number five, sick folks were being laid in the streets. And number six, multitudes from other cities brought their sick and their possessed, and all were healed. Were the priests against signs, wonders, and the healing of sick people? Well, consider that they themselves had no power from God to perform any of those things. And we might conclude that the priests were envious and angry at the same time. Certainly, they had nothing comparable to offer to the people, and they could easily sense that the hearts of the people were toward the apostles and not themselves. So the high priest did what only he could do. He flexed his political muscles and made threats. Acts chapter 5, verse number 18. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Now remember that the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. So what does God do to confront their wrong thinking? Acts chapter 5, verse number 19 and verse 20. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Now, I'm going to sidetrack for a couple of minutes, but I promise to come back. In this Acts study, we have been looking together at various differences between the former dispensation and our present dispensation of the grace of God. And here is another one. The Jews always had many dealings with angels. 
If you are familiar with your Bible, you should be able to recall without much effort a dozen or more stories of angels conversing with Jews, fighting for and defending Jews and other dealings. But in our present dispensation, our Apostle Paul never tells us to expect anything from an angel. He does warn us not to receive another gospel from an angel, and he does warn us not to be caught up in a voluntary humility toward an angel, nor are we to worship an angel. Paul tells us those things, and he tells us that those who promote that wrong thing are intruding into things which they have not seen and are puffed up by their fleshly mind. Several years ago, there was a man who claimed to be a pastor and who was in the city where I live. He claimed that an angel came into his bedroom at three o'clock in the morning and taught him spiritual things. Now, I don't believe for a minute that that angel came from God to teach that man Bible truth for the very simple reason that Bible truth is learned when the child of God will study the Word of God and rightly divide it as he is commanded. That's how we are to learn. You and I can learn the Word of God when we seek the God of the Word and pray to Him for understanding. Amen. And an angel never enters the equation at all. Do not ever put yourself into a voluntary, humble position so as to receive anything from an angel. Ellen White was famous for writing about visions given to her by angels, and which many times were in direct contradiction to the Word of God. The Apostle Paul properly classed all such things like that as departures from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And he also called them old wives' fables. Okay, my sidetrack is finished. Coming back now to our story in Acts chapter number 5, the Sadducees proved to be hard-hearted in the face of multiple miracles and even an angelic jailbreak. Nothing seemed to move them. But look what happened after the disciples were brought back in front of the council. Acts chapter number 5, verse number 27 and 28. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Clearly, signs, wonders, and sick folks being healed were not enough to move the stubborn Sadducees. This matter of being guilty of the blood of the innocent Lord Jesus Christ was neither idle talk, speculation, nor superstition. I remind you of a conversation that took place early in the morning on the day that Christ was crucified. Matthew chapter 27, verses 24 and 25. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Now I'm sure the chief priests and elders of Israel never expected the Holy Spirit of God to be listening to them, much less to quote every word that they ever spoke to Governor Pontius Pilate. Well, it should come as no surprise that both Jews and Gentiles fully understood that it was wrong to condemn and put to death an innocent man. You can see that with the attitude and the expressions and the words of Pontius Pilate. No doubt the priests and elders of Israel 
gave their remarks with a remembrance of Deuteronomy chapter number 19 and verse number 10. That innocent blood be not shed in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. Now that the innocent blood of the Lord Jesus Christ had been shed, it is little wonder that the priests and elders of Israel wish to disown their responsibility. But more than that, I understand from their words that they assume the apostles are aiming only to bring the priests and elders of Israel down into disrepute and shame. Well, this kind of thinking was nothing less than a guilty conscience working overtime. Obviously, they'd never taken the opportunity to actually come out and hear what the apostles were preaching and what they were teaching. But now, they were about to hear something quite surprising indeed. Signs, wonders, and a multitude of healed folks did not move their hard hearts, but something they were about to hear was going to penetrate the innermost part of their hardened hearts. Let's read on, Acts chapter 5, verse number 29 through 33. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart. As a matter of fact, the apostles wished no ill will toward Israel's leaders. Peter's words focused on the fact that Jesus had been raised up, exalted by God the Father to be both a prince and a savior and to give repentance to Israel. In other words, Israel could repent for killing their Christ because repentance had been granted to them and they could be forgiven for their sins. But anybody who's ever tried to offer forgiveness to another who has done wrong knows how angry that one can become if they have not yet even admitted to doing wrong. You know what I mean. The apostles were right on target with their words, being holy men of God and speaking as the Holy Ghost moved them and gave them utterance. How convicting were the apostles' words when they said, we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. The truth of their words was all too obvious and just too much information for those men who had recently crucified Christ. Yes, they were convicted. Yes, they were cut to the heart but not in such a way that they were agreeable to owning up to their sin and repenting. Let's finish the passage. Acts chapter 5, verse 33. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered, and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, 
and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, Refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply you be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. One other great lesson that should be learned from this passage and which we did not have time to develop today is the great example that the apostles showed by prioritizing their obedience to God over obedience to man. That was no mere idealistic wish on their part, but how they actually lived their lives. As the passage closes, we have a view of the believers daily declaring Jesus Christ in the temple and from house to house. So, what have we learned from chapter 5 of Acts? We have observed that kingdom authority was on full display from the first to the last. The apostles demonstrated their possession of the keys of the kingdom of heaven in their discernment, their judgment, and punishment of Ananias and Sapphira. The apostles carried out the great kingdom commission with all the promised signs and wonders being done and all the sick and possessed being healed. When enemies opposed them, God gave angelic intervention to free them from the prison. And so we could say from beginning to end, Acts chapter 5 is a record of the authority of the apostles as God's appointed judges over the nation of Israel. In the future kingdom of Christ on earth, true holiness and justice will be the rule. Judgment will be fast and fair, exactly as it was in the case of Ananias and Sapphira here. When Christ returns to the earth, gives Israel the new covenant, and the absolute blotting out of their sins, the twelve apostles will again be here on earth to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. And together, they will govern the whole world. Kingdom authority will be at 100%. Christ will be present. And the gates of hell will not prevail against them. That's the end of our Bible study for today. Feel free to leave questions, comments, or conversation. I'll talk to you again next time right here on Bible Believers Video. Thanks again for watching. God bless and have a wonderful day.